Good evening, everyone. We'll get started with the prayers on page nine. I take refuge until I am reached by the merit of listening these three teachings. May I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all living beings. May all living beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May all living beings be for sorrow and cause of sorrow. May all living beings not be separated from the bliss that is soulless. May all living beings live attachment and hatred to all those near ones afar by living with equanimity. May all living beings have happiness and cause of happiness. May all living beings be free from sorrow and the cause of sorrow. May all living beings and not be separated from the bliss that is soulless. May all living beings live attachment and hatred to all the near ones afar by living with their good images. <laughs> In accordance with the predisposition of intelligence, sentient beings, we request you to turn the Dharma wheel of greater this in common vehicle. <laughs> With the brilliance of your wisdom, a compassionate one, illumine the darkness, ignorance, and closing my mind, enlighten my intelligence and wisdom so that I may gain insight into the Buddha's words and texts that explain them. <laughs> So, our final session on this topic of um, what we call Buddhism in a nutshell. We have looked at uh, uh, the very important uh, uh, the theoretical teachings on the, the, the understanding the life, its situation, and the problems that life faces and how one can best understand that to be a universal nature of all existence and not only are things uh, 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 and unsatisfactoriness stems and originates from uh, one's wrong views and afflictions regarding them 
uh, that, but at the same time, even the wrong views and afflictions, however uh, much sufferings and pain uh, they may have caused, they too, like all things, are impermanent, and therefore uh, the cessation or problem stoppage of those sufferings is totally possible, because the cause is if it is apprehended properly then then the result can be stopped by uh, uh, by learning how to de-escalate the cause and slowly you know be bringing up uh, to, to a complete stop the complete stoppage of the sufferings so that makes oneself to uh, what makes the buddhist uh, you know is the one who become awakened uh, awakened in the sense of not intellectually through study and reading, but uh, also once uh, one become uh, awakened from the the kind of pattern of thinking that is causing the suffering. So what is contemplation? So therefore, you are thinking and your contemplation is changing. Your thinking is changing. If if the uh, what do you call uh, Buddha Dharma and teachings of the enlightened ones. Um, is actually uh, is making a, a effect on us, then our thinking is changing, our attitudes are changing, and so therefore the wrong views are are, 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 are slowly you know, weakening. When the wrong views are weakening, uh, the that means certain physical, uh, verbal, and attitudinal habits are changing. So therefore, part of the contemplation makes ourselves here. They, so they call it Buddhist thought. You know, If you have the Buddhist thought up your, uh, not only intellectual understanding, but actually that they have become your thinking, and that they become your uh, admirable thinking. This Now you like what you think. Because of this, it is it is making us more intelligible, and uh, in doing so, uh, then uh, we we become more awakened that its suffering is caused by thoughts, not by things. Uh, uh, and things are can contribute and and uh, I would say stimulate and and uh, and. Uh, and provoke, but if we have a good thought, good mind, then those things do not have the same uh, effect uh, that the weak mind used to have. The weak mind become fall prey to the objects, and uh, whereas uh, that the, those who have power of mindfulness, power of thought, contemplation, and their thinking is now uh, changing, and uh, they really could see how much stronger and safer they are in their in their thoughts and they're very cognizant of the changes they are making in their thought uh, so it's called thought transformation because basically there's a lot of you know when the real dharma <clears throat> is when we are able to change our attitudes outwardly we may do certain dharma behaviors chanting praying doing devotional things owning and using some devotional objects and uh, rituals and so forth you know we may have we may have learned to do many devotional things outwardly but inwardly we must be able to uh, uh, drop uh, yeah drop uh, things uh, that that we are like say same degree of ill will or anger over some issue you don't have the same uh, uh, fixated view that what our anger is caused by. Previously, we think our anger is caused by objects and events. Uh, he did this, they are like that, therefore I'm angry. So that was our attitude, you know. Now, um, most people still believe that. They still think they know Buddhism, but the problem is caused by him. The problem is caused by them. I know Buddhism, but it's your problem. <laughs> so, but the person who is experiencing uh, experiencing the actual dharma, when we say Buddhism in a nutshell, you know, that you have to you have to be able to taste uh, the nut. The really, you know, yeah, it has to, you know, peanut is no peanut unless you can unshell it and take the nut and then eat it. You know, <laughs> so so formality, the devotion, the rituals. 
the culture, the language, and the prayer, all these things are just the, the outer kind of form of Buddhism. The true Buddhism is whereby we are able to change our attitude, you know, transformation of our attitude. From learning Dharma, I've said quite a few of you have been on the few months, few years, you know, you could see how much you are learning to change and you have, how much you know need to change, you know, our attitude towards someone, for instance, towards some things. That is called part of what we call contemplation versus power of listening. So this is listening, contemplation, and meditation. Um, listening uh, uh, informs us into, as a knowledge-wise the concepts like the Four Noble Truths and, uh, and Seals of Dharma, Triple Gem, all those things are just, a, just a knowledge, the theoretical knowledge you hear and read about it. But then we need to we need to actually develop a, 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 a change made by these concepts into our mind. So much so that we are actually now changing our thoughts uh, about objects. So it's not the objects don't have an enduring quality that is themselves. Objects are what we think of it. When we change our, what we think of it, then our way we relate to the object changes. So a Buddhist person is uh, um, uh, have a have an attitude uh, of uh, of not seeing objects as independently existing thing, but object is a reflection of his mind, his thought. You know, sometimes we have that. Oh, it's my thought. No, no, it's him. You know, we we still think it's the object. We are Buddhists, but we still think it's the object. <laughs> So we flip out of Buddhism quickly. <laughs> we slip out of being Buddhist very quickly. <laughs> Straight away we think it's the object, you know. <laughs> the, uh, in Buddhism we call Buddhist and non-Buddhist. Tibetan word is chiba. Chiba means external and nangba means internal. Buddhists are the nangba, external. And everything is all your mind, internal mind. It's all your in mind that is doing. And, uh, and uh, those who believe there are external, the materialists do that. Those who believe in, in creation do that. It's always created by others or God or, 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 or some other schools. They think it's all things are all there. There is something intrinsic in the object that there. But Buddhists say, no, it's only your mind. Mind only, we call it. One of the Buddhist schools is called mind only. It's only your mind that you need to change. And, and when you know that it's your mind, then it's, it, it gives us so much power to change just our mind. <laughs> you don't have to then change people or places or things. Uh, it's artificially, sometimes it makes a relief, you know, by changing some artificially objects or places. Uh, some relief, some temporary relief is found by changing objects and things because our mind seems to find us some kind of sigh of temporal relief, like a little sugar coating. <laughs> uh, but afterwards, you realize we still got the problem about wherever we go, or whoever we are, we are with, or whatever we do. So then you realize it's not so much the object uh, that it is out there, the attitudes. So changing of our mind, mind. So when you when your contemplation, when your thinking changes, you know, then you could see the uh, dharma. Dharma is really medicine. Just the dharma that you studied and read and uh, believed is has the power even in us that we could change. You know, you would re win a respect in you. You would find a new friend in you that is more reliable, more heedful, uh, more kinder towards yourself, and more caring, more wise, more intelligent. <laughs> Uh, than we previously thought we, because otherwise we were trashing ourselves. We think we almost cross ourselves, you know, I'm not good enough, that's it, full stop. Uh, you know, I have to be another person or I have to get a new rebirth to become. We have no idea that it is the mind that needs to be flipped. <laughs> and when you are flipped, when you're able to do those flips, when you're able to change your thought, attitudes, straight away the objects of previous anger or, or, or blame now becomes objects of love and forgiveness. You know, someone left a left a note here. I'm sure they they listened to the teachings quite a while, 
and left here. And um, uh, so we are often deceived by, uh, by what we think, you know. But uh, if we were to come, if we were to be, uh, you know, to be corrected from the deception, we will have to uh, do, uh, reject the wrong view we have about the person. And then instead of being angry at them, they are the person who deserves our forgiveness, our understanding, our love. And they are usually your own half a dozen people of circle, of concern of circle within that. And so how could I justify being angry at this if I'm going to make any changes? So therefore one drops the anger and then replaces that with forgiveness and love and understanding and supporting. When you're able to do that, that is dharma. That is the dharma. That's the realization dharma. And the teaching says practice forgiveness, practice tolerance, and we we nod, we are we are, we we agree. We had we we nod our head. We yes yes. I heard that. Yes, it's really good. It's very good to practice. That. That's really good. That's what Buddha said too. Yeah 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 yeah. But when it comes to doing it, we are not doing it. So we haven't got the realization of dharma. <laughs> we just know it, but cannot do it. You know, cannot do it. So Buddhism, in a nutshell, is whereby we actually experience the dharma. That is self-transformation. You feel ever so grateful to the Dharma. You feel ever so grateful to the Sangha. You feel ever so grateful to the Buddha, like, like no other. You know, previously you were doing cultural thing. You because others did, you did that. You bow down because others was bow down. <laughs> you were doing those just cultural things. Now you deep utmost, utmost respect and devotion to the triple gem. So the, a Buddhist uh, uh, person in the context is a uh, Buddhism in a nutshell is person must not become just intellectually geared towards Buddhist philosophy, but emotionally receptive and accepting of the triple gem. Completely accepting, unconditionally accepting, unquestionably. We have used our little sort of a uh, little sort of rider of mind that scrutinized Buddhism. You know, teaching says, investigate, check. Until you check, don't accept it. <laughs> you, know? you know, of course, it's amazingly inviting. And that is such a nice thing to be inviting and not imposing us that you've got to take it or leave it. You've got 24 hours type of thing. <laughs> not like that. It's check and examine carefully. Please make sure you haven't got the wrong dharma. <laughs> this might not be Buddhism. First go and check. Teaching says this so carefully because it has nothing to lose, you know. It only can benefit people more than investigate. After a little bit of study, a little bit of reasoning, a little bit of checking, and then we got to stop. We got to stop the cynicism, and and as we got some amazing intelligence that nobody can, you know, as, uh, can uh, unlike other people. All the people in the past uh, unconditionally received the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha in their life and took refuge. Yeah, and then uh, and found need to declare themselves as Buddhist, and actually formally spiritually embracing the Triple Gem. And that's, and a Buddhism in a nutshell, is a person who follow Buddhism these days, secularly or intellectual Buddhist, there's a lot of them, and spiritually still not quite sure, you know. And, and, and that is, that is per, per, perfectly fine. His Holiness Dalai Lama discourages people converting the religion out of respect for people who have some other religious background. But what he's really implying is, once you have really searched and studied for a while, life is too short to be in always investigating and being on the fence line, you know. <laughs> and neither belong to that, nor belong to that, just always standing on the fence. <laughs> so life is too short, too precious to be wasting in this, in this, in this testing business, you know. <laughs> always testing, always testing. <laughs> so... So one time one must stop testing, sport checking. Now I must really go serious. So once one has completely embraced the Dharma, so through the, through the study of Dharma, contemplating, then one practice meditation. 
When you start doing the Buddhist meditation, you have accepted the teachings and practice, and it is already transforming your life and your perception, you know. And if once it is doing that, uh, you can see the more you are able to employ the meditation discipline, the that much deeper realization of the teaching is occurring into your mental horizon. You know? Then it's not only when you read and discuss Buddhism things make sense, but deep down there's amazing, inalienable, you know, you no, know, inseparable part of you. Your heart has become very much soaked absorbed, blessed by the Buddha Dharma. You know, you breathe, you live uh, the Dharma. You know, even when you're, you're very, very, you're having amazing experience, you, you, you have some amazing successful things happening in your life, but you realize this is amazing. But this too is a result of some good karma of the past, but this also are not permanent. If I'm afflicted with greed and possessiveness to this, all these good things I have could be poisoned by this clinging and attachment to this. So you become very cautious, <laughs> cautious. Even even some newfound glories and and success are are, are treated Buddhistically, Buddhistically, and then use them wisely, and knowing that this too will not stay long. Therefore, I must be mindful, skillful to use. So you remember impermanence. You remember impermanent, and knowing that, you know that I should not be engrossed in this, but make this to be a uh, alerter for me that things happen and that things change dramatically. So my attitude uh, about the things, even good things happening, you don't get puffed up. And then let forgive that, forget dharma. You, know. you don't get totally swung into the worldly activities too much because some good things happening, and then forget the dharma. You know, dharma isn't a practice that when you do, you do when you're desperate. <laughs> dharma is a you know your bread and butter of every day, <laughs> not not when you're desperate. You know, even when things are going very well, it is a refuge. You know, what is going very well is also unsatisfactory, really. You know, whatever good worldly things are going, it's not going to last forever. It's not going to. So if we get attached to that, it becomes even more unsatisfactory. So even good things going very well, we still, re, 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 we still renew refuge in the triple zero. So that we do not become consumed by this worldly or newfound uh, some comfort or success or glory or uh, whatever, worldly things. You know that these things are worldly things. You're not dismissing them. You're not sort of saying that you are too advanced to be. You, you, you deeply, deeply appreciate the merit and karma. To be blessed is so much better than not to be blessed. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, that you know how not to be consumed by this. See this? Now, now you're realizing your meditation, the meditation you have been doing is now empowering you to transform your things you have, you're not getting attached to them and enslaved by them. Yeah. And so as a result of that, um, you, you are, you are, your, your desire or your, 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 your desire doesn't, uh, in, uh, imp uh, yeah, doesn't, desire doesn't enslave you. Your, ach your achievement of desire, success of desire, doesn't enslave you. You realize these are all futile, really. If I don't have dharma, uh, none of these are of any value. So you always assess your worldly life in relation to dharma. And then the dharma is really uh, uh, is able to prevent you from being consumed by materialism or the worldly gain or wealth or success or or whatever we think are good, but they are good, but they are only good for a while. And dharma, it's nothing is as good as dharma. And so even good things that happen do not l let to consume ourselves. So that's just one sign of uh, one sign of. What I'm saying is dharma being applied. Applied dharma helps us to prevent uh, that. Even the difficult going through your life, yeah, you, 
You're practicing Dharma. You thought you are in refuge and you should be prevented from illness and catastrophes and uh, all these things. You know, you have refuge, you know, so we are refuge. We are now, we have got, we have found asylum. <laughs> we should be now safe from any old problems. You think that as a Buddhist you should be that. But when you experience your fair share of karma, in illness or death or, or loss or or whatever difficulties, you know, with interpersonal difficulties, whatever, instead of being sort of defeated by them, you think, That's, this happens to everybody. Oh, no, I have dharma to cope with this now. So instead of being defeated by this loss and sickness and illness and partings or, or whatever it is, you, instead of uh, defeated by this, your knowledge of dharma you know, have guarded you from falling into pieces. <laughs> That's the refuge. That's the real refuge. And you see this exhaustion of karma and, uh, and your health goes down. It's, uh, you know, health is, body is never, body is never an eternal body. It is, it's called, some people call it transient collection. You know, uh, other people translate that as perishable collections. <laughs> perishable collection. Our <laughs> body is a perishable collection. So when the perishables are perishing, it's not surprising. <laughs> it's written perishable. <laughs> so you don't get shocked by seeing the perishable perishing, isn't it? <laughs> so this is very important with this terminology. Jigzo. In Tibetan, jigzo means collection of, of, a, of, a, of a transient things. Transient collection, probably more technically correct. <laughs> Perishable sounds like a, a bit like a food. <laughs> yeah. And when your health is going down, maybe your wealth, your business, your friendship, your families, yeah, everything is not quite hanging together. And it's not a shock to you. Why? You know that's the nature of the existence. So you don't uh, uh, think it's your fault. You don't think it's their fault. It's the nature of the existence. This is the nature of the things, you know, it's put together, you know. And so, uh, nowadays when they do buildings, and even skyscrapers, they bring, they build, they are all built to last, say, 50 years, 100 years. You know, when it's 50 years, or building that meant to last 50 years, by 40, you already know it's going to have only 10 years left. And when it shows the sign of wear and tear by 40, of course you wouldn't be trying to pretend it's going to live another 50 years. <laughs> you know, like that, a Buddhist person who has the, Buddhism in a nutshell, the person who has tasted the very nut of Dharma knows that all artificial form of stability and strength and all these things are just form and internally nothing is staying same everything's changing and collapsing because of that even things do fall apart difficult you don't react as a shock with shock and disbelief as some unprecedented happening to us you know we don't have this poor me anymore when you have true dharma we know that this is happening to all the P2 people most of the time. It's just our share only happens, only sell occasionally because we are among the few fortunate. Most people's lives just completely, you have no idea how many people's lives are many times worse, unheard of stories. So instead of moaning and groaning our difficulties, but even when we are going through difficult, we are going through very good times, but we still do not indulge in them, knowing others are not having even part of it, party of it. And so we therefore dedicate little things we have. May we, we do it uh, with that kind of prayerfulness, um, thinking of others. I say praying for the deceased, for instance, when you do praying for the deceased. You realize you are alive, but you are able to think of dying and disease quite well because they have died. And what must be like to be the dead and the immediate relatives of the loved ones? Just who have therefore they have lost. What must be like? And then you pour your kindness and compassion for them. 
instead of thinking it's their suffering and not mine. So because we are so good at embracing all sufferings, our own suffering seems like a very small. <laughs> it, it doesn't sort of have this sting anymore. Because of there, we are no longer this trying to preserve the self. <laughs> because self is emptiness, remember? You can't just preserve emptiness. <laughs> You can't put a put a boundary in the sky saying this is my land, <laughs> you know, because the, you can't be like that. Uh, you become very Buddhist. Buddhist meaning that that uh, your own suffering is not a a, a a tragedy. Your own suffering is a in in, in alerter of self compassion. You have to practice compassion. Like us, like others, the suffering is, is, is constant. It's constant. It's like a river is always flowing. And uh, you can't deny the river flowing when the river is continuous flowing. So the whole samsara and world is continuously drowned in the river. And we are and occasionally hit by the flood of the river. <laughs> others are completely drowned in the river continuously, like animals and hungry goats and hell beings and many unfortunate human beings and drowned in poverty and war stone places and famine and and uh, you just think about it. they are only they only biped in human and form, but their life is not like we live. When you're able to incorporate that into your daily mind, then we are actually uh, deep down, and you know, we use the word sentient being a lot. You know, we know that the plight of other sentient beings are unimaginably, you know, if you really think about it, it's so so unsettling uh, for us to not to think about them. When we think about them, uh, we realize. What is it that I do not have the same degree of suffering? What did I do to deserve this? And then you become really realized that you are in a very amazing position to do something, um, make a difference in other people's lives. Because of that, we do not become drowned in suffering and sorrow. Why? Because we have transformed our mind of the afflictions. So, so this is the realization of Dharma I'm talking about. Because we are able to transform our mind and try to, try to remove the afflictions, you know, seizing our mind, you know, because we meditate, because we read, because we listen to the Dharma. And because of this, they actually always help us how to guard the mind from being consumed and afflicted and, dis and, and suppressed by the afflictions. We become more observant of our mind and its afflictions rather than minding people and what they do. That was the time we, when we were not da in Dharma. And, uh, you know, as a Buddhist, we no longer complain about other people. Yes, we do. That other people is ourselves. <laughs> now the other person we previously didn't complain is now complaining. Is this this other person? This is the other person we didn't apprehend. <laughs> so once you do that, and because now your hands are free from blaming others, at least this kind of self-blaming is is called responsibility, karma. <laughs> You know, you, you actually take responsibility, not being denigrating yourself. Remember? No denigration here. Actually responsibility. People who admit their own follies, their own karma and affliction. And it's a, it's great. It's a it's a it's called noble one. Noble one is one who admit their karma and their own afflictions. And uh, and uh, and so uh, now we no longer are blaming others because we are Buddhist. You know, a Buddhist person uh, should think the role of the mind rather than of the object. Of course, that's a step much forward, forward than before. Now we are advancing. Previously, we were always blaming others, or things, or places, or objects. Now, for a Buddhist, meaning that he's an insider. No longer outsider, you know. Outsider meaning outside of the right view. They have no 
they haven't obtained the right view. It's just like a person has not been admitted into school. He's an outsider. He doesn't know these things. He's never got taught. Person who admitted, who entered into the doorway of Dharma, are taught and trained and given this wisdom. And as a result of that, you have the inside knowledge. It's called inner science, the science of the mind, the role and the, and the responsibilities and the difference that your mind can make. And when you recruit the mind to do that, it no longer dwells, no longer talks about other people anymore. You know, when they do, they have slipped back out of the door again. <laughs> you know? And it's quite easy to slip out. And, but when you know that you have slipped out, that's exactly, you at least know that you have been inside there a few times. Intellectually, emotionally, you have been, you really have been enchanted and inspired by the Buddha Dharma. And how, how long can we stay in the, within the interior of the Dharma wall, not slip out of the gate, is how much refuge we have in the Triple Gem. So a Buddhist, in the formal sense, takes refuge in the Triple Gem and make a vow to employ the discipline to prayer and, to, and meditate regularly in their daily life. And then take it seriously because, because you can see the changes and transformation changes you're making. Because you can, if you're changing, then you are not only longing for changing, you're not wishing changing, you're actually adopting change. But changes are made step by step, gradually. And gradually, and and the, the changes are, ch the changes are made uh, by, uh, in what you call, by uh, embracing the path. Person who has taken the refuge of the triple gem, then try to embrace the noble path. So we're going to talk a little bit about the eightfold path in that case, uh, in the in the meaning that uh, when a person is. Um, person has a sense of being Buddhist in themselves. They actually have a few ways of doing things that is really guarded and guided by Dharma and they're really so happy they've got a guide. And that guide is another person. That the guide is inner conscience. This in, inner conscience in your own mind that you know that you it's like the Buddha within or or the guru within or whatever. We call realization Dharma. You realize it. Until you have the realization of Dharma, you've got to meditate. If you meditate and listen and study and contemplate a lot, then the, the inner weight of the, your uh, guide becomes uh, always there, something there to turn to. They say, please, we pray to turn to the Dharma. Yeah, Always you turn to the Dharma, listen to your heart, and sit down before making hasty decisions. Deep down in your heart, it is... And um, so, this means, so you, when you follow the path, there are eightfold paths. This eightfold path where you're going to go uh, is divided into three parts. Uh, uh, the, 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 what do we call the training of the self-discipline, training of the meditation, training of the wisdom. So, that's just the general kind of outline of it. But there are eight things. The first is the uh, right view. So the right view is that we talked about the four seals of Dharma. Uh, so when you when you have those four right views, uh, it makes us to re reject the wrong views. Uh, wrong views, thinking that life is about pleasure and happiness. Life is not filled with pleasure and happiness. Life is unfortunately filled with suffering and unsatisfactoriness. So uh, when you do face your fair share of unsatisfactoriness and suffering, then you become accepted. You accept that. That's the right view to accept it. It's not just the right view, but you actually accept. You have the you have the you have the Buddhistness. You have to. It's just Buddhists to who accept. Who don't look for an uh, you look for someone else to implicate. So 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 therefore the right view, and why you accept it? Because as soon as you accept. It, you have changed your attitude about the sufferings. Why? You believe in the law of impermanence. Yeah, you have made it impermanent. 
Previously, we didn't change. We just resist, we resist, we resist. We retaliate. Now, we don't. That was the way childish, worldly people who are outside the gate do that all the time. <laughs> who are the outsiders do that all the time. Now, we are inside the gate, inside the Dharma. So, instead of uh, uh, rejecting and uh, mourning and groaning and complaining, we just accept that. And making that acceptance means we have changed. Previously, we were just retaliating, we are reacting, we are making it, duplicating the problem. Now, by accepting, we are not only believing in impermanence, but we are doing that is impermanent. You see? See, the right view is now, uh, you are accepting the side of suffering, you are using uh, impermanent. <laughs> and by doing this, you are, you are less selfish, you know. It's, there is no, it looks like there is no old, ordinary, old self left. <laughs> So the third right view is there's no self, remember? There's no self, yeah. Look, there is no enduring same self that is permanent. It's changing. <laughs> changing week by week. Dharma is really amazing that you, you change yourself as a, as a result of your perspective of others. And so therefore... You are these right three right views, right view regarding suffering and impermanence and selflessness are now all used. And then, how do you know? How do you know that you are, you are following the right view? You have a lot of peace in your everyday life. You are much more contented. You are less uh, consumed by affliction. Nirvana is peace. That's the fourth seal of Dharma. You actually have, you actually have peace in everyday life. Your life is not filled with anguish and, and craving and violence and, and uh, argument. You, there are those things, but, but deep down, you can make peace very quickly. You know, for a couple of minutes, you get really, really uptight, and then you're no longer like that anymore. Usually people stay like that for days, you know. But now we can end them very quickly. Why? We have Dharma. <laughs> Nirvana is peace, but you actually, Nirvana isn't some the end result when you do finish the crossing line, you know. Nirvana is daily Nirvana. Bring small Nirvanas, <laughs> small cessations, small cessation of the sorrows, you know, what do we call it? small acts of kindness that you yourself do by resorting to the right view. Three, first three right views you employ, then your sufferings are short-lived. You can actually make the sufferings impermanent and, and not long enduring. There is no long suffering. That there is no truly existing suffering. Yeah? So the right view. So that will be perfect, wouldn't it? That if you can do that right view. But that is the end result. But in order to have that, you know, you got to practice the other sevenfold paths. You know, sevenfold paths. Huh? And say, if we describe the from the current the sequence, second uh, eightfold path. Second of the eightfold path is the uh, the right uh, intention. So then you, uh, you you intention is motivation. Because you know that suffering and unsatisfactoriness, impermanence, helplessness, and nirvana very clearly, you realize your intention has to be selfless. You know? Intention has to be altruistic, selfless. If you are Buddhist, you, before you do anything, check one's intention. You know? Even you know the right view, all of that, but still when you try to do something, what is my intention here? If intention is about self-preservation, to make us look good, to prove that others are wrong, that we are good, we do that. It's selfish, again. So the intention should be, right intention is called right thought or right intention, meaning that we are actually learning to quash the selfish mind. I apprehend that as the root cause of sufferings. That even the wrong view is, a, is one thing, but the habit of the wrong view is self-preservation. You know? Now we realize selflessness, we actually, attitude is selfless. So right attitude is always think of the benefit of others before benefit to oneself. So that is the, uh, what we call right uh, attitude. We call altruistic attitude, but uh, in a pan-Buddhistic level, we don't have to use the altruism because altruism is unique to Mahayana Buddhism. But generally speaking, goodwill, yeah? 
kindness, kind heart, uh, selfless thought. When person does selfless thing, it's so moving and, and it's so inspiring. When person does something selfish, you know, it is so, 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 so unencouraging, so, so, so uh, selfish, people will notice. So a person who is, who is touched by Dharma, who has the benefit of the right intellectual view of Buddhism, now starting to uh, address their attitude, their intention. Karma they believe, but no longer some fatalistic thing. Oh, it's my karma, my karma. But if you believe in karma, which means cause and effect, your intention is the cause. Now, if you're becoming better at mending and, and repairing your, changing your intention, then you're learning to, to vary the causes. When you vary the causes, then the effect will be different. You know? If the effect, a cause is selfish, the result will be suffering. You know? So, simple as that. Very Buddhist. You don't have to go hunting. Where is where did my suffering come from? <laughs> selfishness is the center of it. <laughs> you know, in the recent days of selfishness or weeks, months, years, selfishness is just all about that. Whether it's just over one issue between two person argument is the how much is the argument a problem? Is whoever is more selfish finds a lot of problem. The others not. So selfishness that's very obvious. Uh, cause of suffering. So, a person is Buddhist meaning insider. The outsider will do the former. Being selfish, thinking that it's going to benefit him or, or, or defeat the other, which is completely unproductive. The one who's heard the Buddhist has the right attitude. It's insider's attitude. Insider means inside knowledge. <laughs> You've got the secret knowledge. The real cause of happiness is selflessness. Selflessness. Even somebody is really awkward, really, really un unfair to you, but their unfairness is no excuse for you to behave selfishly. <laughs> but however uh, unfair somebody is, but still we can only benefit them by our selflessness. They are not with themselves. Now, do we want to become like that ourselves? Then when the two person are not with the, either of the two, then that will be double problem, double trouble. They go. <laughs> At least one of the two who gain their senses, they are doing this, but I should practice selflessly to help them to ease their difficulties, to be tolerant, to be caring for them, give them a breathing space. If I did this, then it's not a question of proving who's right and who's wrong. It's the question is who's kind and who's not. If you can be the kind, that's the, that's the most productive thing you can do. See, it comes back to the right attitude, being kind, not being right. It's very dangerous. If you have the right view, you know, particularly the first, the right view, you really, there are lots of people, kind people, are really resentful later on. <laughs> so kindness without wisdom, you know, is, is cause of resentment. So therefore you learn to, not to uh, practice resentment, but practice kindness uh, with a good intention. So right thought. So practicing right thought, right intention. Always checking, uh, as a Buddhist, always checking what's my intention of doing this. And that's a really mindful, mindfulness, right intention. And then the, then the third one is right action, means what do you do. If you have the right view in the head and right attitude, right intention in the heart, then what you do uh, means right action, meaning what is the action that is right is nonviolent. Uh, harmless. So that the whatever direct uh, action we do, if it directly injures to li living beings life and their feelings and destructive to properties, one should learn to restrict and uh, restrain from harmful, violent, uh, destructive things. And therefore instead, what is right action is try to 
uh, protect life, try to save life, uh, try to uh, try to uh, heal injured ones, try to support uh, the the sick and unwell and uh, and difficult situations, and try to uh, be practice kindness because their feeling is pain, pain or hurt. And uh, try to, uh, you know, instead give things, uh, practice generosity. You know, practicing generosity is a right action. Giving heals people, gives them hope. Because they, some people are really, really disappointed. Nobody gives them anything. And they take, 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 gives nothing. But if they meet someone who gave them a little, they will, this will revive the hell hope. And so giving is a very good right action. If you have a conflict, you don't know how to resolve the conflict. Uh, usually people, people say who's right, who's wrong to resolve the conflict. You know, they even hire another person to tell who's right and who's wrong and get listen to their verdict. <laughs> but instead you realize to, to solve this problem, I need to practice the right action by giving something for the cause of the conflict. If you gave something, generosity usually heals conflicts. That's a right action. And of course you don't want to injure and hurt anybody's life or property, but instead you give your possessions, your things. If your things in your possession is doing idle, doing nothing, but as soon as it goes in the hand of others, it may perform miracles. And so you, don't you want to see the things that it wasn't doing much in your possession to perform miracles? And then you wouldn't realize how much it brought friendship and hope in the others. Right action. Right action is... I know. One thing to restrain, another thing to protect life. Give things that can give, revive the hope. Yeah. And uh, if those people who are fighting, try to mediate them. Try to, try to bring them together through your uh, kindness, through your skillfulness, through your own uh, act of goodwill. Try to do that. Because it's so difficult to be, build friends and so easy to become uh, losing the friendship. And if you can just repair them to remain good, you will have saved a lot of trouble. These are right action. Right action. Traditionally, uh, you know, uh, of course, the right action could be like, say, not killing or something. That's a, just a that's just a prohibitive action. But many, the, what is it, what we should do instead is we try to uh, try to save the injured. We, we try to repair. We try to heal the injured physically, emotionally injured one, and then by giving, you know, giving things to people, giving for people. These are right action. A Buddhist person gives for the sake of their resolution. You gave them and then, then the other one is happy and then the other one is also no longer a problem <laughs> because someone else did that and then their problem was solved. <laughs> it's amazing. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you would you'd be feeling enticed to do that. You know? Wonderful. And that is right action. That is a right attitude. That is the right view. <laughs> you have made your things that are sitting there doing nothing, you change the position from him, your position to other, made the impermanent location, <laughs> made <the> miracles. <laughs> Previously in your possession, came out of your pocket, went into somebody's hand, and they're happy. Now they no longer are ang angry or crying. And see, see, you can, you can perform, <laughs> you can actually apply the right view in the action. Right action becomes right view, uh, you know, when, if you don't have the right view, you can perform, cannot perform right action. Because this is my thing. Why should I give it to him? <laughs> but we don't realize even what we have all came from others. And with happiness too, you know. Everything we have are a gift of others. And so it would be even better if it if changed from other hand, another hand. And then you practice right action. That's a Buddhist. A real Buddhist is... You give not because it's yours, because you have the power to give. You know, it's not that you have is the great thing, it's you have the power to give. Then you're truly the master and owner of the give, owner of the thing. But otherwise you are slave to the possession. If you're slave to the possession, you are not better with it. <laughs> it is causing you misery. <laughs> But if you can give the thing to the other, you become master of it. Because then even mineral possessions can make happy. <laughs> Happiness can be produced. 
See, that's the right action. Dana in Buddhism, giving. You know, that's not just uh, making us some kind of ritual giving, but wherever is it warranted, whatever it is, just just anonymously or just just out of the blue, you just felt doing it. And it's just so the right thing to do, and you have no attachment to it, and and and. It's also non-attachment. It is also impermanent, making if you, and also you, 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 and you, and you can actually relieve somebody's sufferings. Also, it relieves your suffering because when you gave something, you no longer have to worry about the thing. <laughs> Previously, it was sitting in your possession. It's worrying you. It's anxious you. You are thinking its value is going down and it's not really going to get a better market and always worry. Now, once you give it. It no longer can cause any sufferings. See? See, now you're really practicing Buddhism. <laughs> you, are, you are actually, you know. And when a person who gives, they always have things. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing karma. The person who doesn't give is always never have enough of things. It's amazing karma. <laughs> so you now know the workings of the law of causality. When you give, you are alive. You are living. When you want to receive, it's just exactly the opposite. We're miserable because we are not. We always want to receive. If we are giving, we are truly alive. See, this is the right action. Right action is giving. It heals people. You know, not everybody is in a level level as we can think like that. Some people, when you give something, it made a huge difference to them. To you, it's nothing. You know. It is quite natural for you to do, but for them, it's a lifesaver. For them, it's a great thing, and they didn't realize somebody could be so kind. To you, it's not being kind. It's just, it's just, uh, just uh, so easy for you to do when you know the Dharma, <laughs> and then it really is. It revives humanity. People find faith in Dharma because Dharma people can do that. And that's why, you know, people practice Buddhism. You know, there's a lot of people think, oh, you're a Buddhist. Oh, people have natural expectation to be forgiving, to be kind, to be not greedy, to be pardoning. <laughs> because it's just, because people see this, you know, people see these things. These are just characters. They don't, they, don't, they don't think, oh, Buddhists, oh, they're violent people. They don't think like that. <laughs> they do the right action. They practice non-violence. They practice generosity. <laughs> so, you know, um, it's, it's not a, just a thing. It's just a name. But what we do, that makes really Buddhist. And Buddhist meaning uh, awakening. It's a, like an awakened person gives. And an unawakened person wants to receive. You know, it's totally different. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> An awakened person always uh, see the danger of the possessiveness of it. You know, the, the unawakened person always wanted to possess more, <laughs> possess more. <laughs> it's just a different mentality. You know, whole different attitude. It doesn't mean that you couldn't acquire, you couldn't go and make a living, and um, it doesn't mean you can't do that. But what you do with them, and what is the attitude, the right attitude with possession. You know, uh, you know, and then you become very, uh, very much a, a miracle maker. Basically, you can make small deeds, but it really makes so much. Like you are awakened because you are you are free of attachment, possessiveness. You're free of of violent, aggressive behavior, physical behavior. You just it just doesn't is not in you. You don't do it. Life is so sacred, so sacred to harm any life is just not in your mind. You become super sensitive to the well-being of every single small living beings. If you can do anything skillful, you will do that. It's not just human life, but, but other uh, less vulner more vulnerable sentient beings who are unprotected, who have no right, who, who, whose, whose plight is never mentioned, and you become more sensitive to their well-being because your kind of altruistic, selfless mind is now manifesting into your action. You know? um, but it doesn't mean the Buddhists become like a kind of a, a aggressive campaigner 
to do things just because they want something. They, they know that there are some things we cannot change due to our limited ability. And, you know, you can't make all the ocean clean water, for instance. You can't make the ocean free of salt. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have streams up the road or, or but, <laughs> but you know, so you don't take on things that are little beyond your ability. So just because we are Buddhist doesn't mean we can change the whole world and we promote that Buddhism is the only way and this is the only way, others are wrong. You don't do that kind of action. It's a wrong action. <laughs> so, so Buddhists have to almost perform and do more uh, more discreetly the Buddhist thing rather than telling and converting or making people to say this is the only way. It's not right action. It wouldn't receive, receive very well. That's why His Holiness Dalai Lama says don't change religion. You know, just stay happily in your religion. Just practice kindness. And what he's doing is really generally basic, basically he's teaching the enlightened way without imposing on people uh, that, you know. But sooner or later people actually get the Dharma and of course they know exactly that he is not talking about um, converting from one religion to another, but rather becoming good person. If there is no good person becoming in one the person doesn't matter he follows five religions <laughs> person who is becoming a little bit changing in themselves then even he does not outwardly pro proclaim as a Buddhist but he's doing the Buddhist thing <laughs> and outwardly maybe he should stay stay for the harmony of the family as a Catholic as a, as a, as a non-believer whatever because that that's that's probably is necessary some places, isn't it? You know, uh, this is particularly in in uh, countries where places where Buddhism is very new and a kind of a as an express practitioner, is we got to be respectful for our parents and our loved ones' feelings, and they may be not really uh, have doesn't got the appetite to look into Buddhism deeply and listen. And read and meditate as much as we do, and for them it's just that's what they do, you know. And so it's selflessly being the supporter of what they do <laughs> once a week or once a year or whenever. Just doing those is a very Buddhist, you know? very very Buddhist. That's supporting somebody, <laughs> not thinking I'm Buddhist. You are not. You go that way. I'm going this way. Type of thing. That's not Buddhist. <laughs> Buddhist is selflessly, selflessly serving others, whichever way, if that can bring them some little peace and and happiness. Let us be the servant to do, make them to do that. Right action. And this means. Next one is the right speech, the fourth one, fourth of the eightfold path, right speech. This is now exactly the same manner. Now, that how small act of kindness can make a difference to some beings, to all, or to all beings, basically. So then you practice right speech, meaning right speech meaning speaking in a way or a language that 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 uh, that uh, respect the other person that makes them cared for loved and and considered and honored and uh, not ignored and uh, and respected and speaking a very harmonious positive uh, uh, respectful language and uh, so that's really buddhist you know <clears throat> Uh, Buddhist means awakened one, wise one. It's a really wise thing to do. It's not saying Buddhist only say that. Lots of all wise people do that, whether they follow Buddhism or not. You will see that. Uh, when, you see, when you know that somebody's kind to you, you can usually tell the way they speak to you, you know, where they speak about you to other people, where, you, where they speak to anybody. And that's kind speech, the right language, right speech. Right speech means you know how to restrain from wrong languages, a wrong way of speaking to or about or manner or intention with which you speak. And you realize the language could be very instrumental in hurting people 
or mending people or healing people. And therefore, Buddhist, when Buddhist means enlightened, Buddhist means awakened, aware. I cannot say this. This is not going to get any benefit. I cannot say this to him or her or about this. This doesn't seem any benefit. So you can see that harmfulness and what could be maximizer of helpfulness. Mindfulness of speaking kindly, wisely, compassionately. And in order to be able to do that, practice chanting, recitation, mantras, prayers. It would bless your speech. It would bless you. You should have prayers. Compile them. Put them together. That's been read and chanted by millions of practitioners every generation. And for us to receive a mantra or prayer, we should honor them, make a habit of saying them regularly. And then that is the right speech. Right speech means, means you're adopting a form of verbal merit making that we previously didn't have. Right speech means form of verbal merit making that what we have, we do not let it degenerate, decline. We keep a daily requirement, the daily commitment, whether it's, whether it's 21 mantras or a couple of minutes or whatever. You always make a, you know, perch yourself on the cushion for a little while and say those mantras. It's really good. <laughs> it, it will bless your speech, you know, making a habit. Of doing, saying the mantras, you re, you you repeated them, you learned them, you got it somewhere. You receive, remember receiving them, and and you have make a habit of reciting them. And you say some prayers if some things are not going very well. Don't just decide on things. Just say some prayers. Think that this will this will change me to make clearer decision down the few days time. Just say prayers. Don't try to run into making decisions when you are not so up in a good space. Have some humility. Give some time. And listen to your heart. Don't listen to the convoluted head and your heart. And then the right speech meaning that you actually are communicating with your heart. And when you are actually having a really, really sensible conversation, what we call monologuing, which is usually ha happens when you are silent, in silence we have some of the best conversations. Because we are here listening to it, we are not criticizing it, and we are deeply listening, and we are listening, and we are not rejecting, we are just considering. And after thinking through carefully, we reach to some kind of clarification. And that kind of internal listening, which is silence to meditation, and also you practice that with others when you practice, when you you mainly are most of a quiet listener rather than rather than saying all the sorts of things. And so observing silence quite a lot of time is more right speech. Not saying anything was the right speech. <laughs> listening everything. Everything and taking all the good days and not really paying attention to the other irrelevant things. That is the right hearing, really. So right speech meaning, really. So ability to practice these three, right attitudes, right intention, right action, right speech. So these three are, you know, we were talking about three trainings, training of the discipline, self-discipline. Self-discipline and mainly the right action a right speech and a right attitude. So mainly the discipline, self-disciplining. And then, and then the fifth one is uh, called right effort. You know? Right effort is a discipline. To do the former, you have to make a, uh, make a deliberate effort. You have to be enthusiastic to do those things. Uh, not tomorrow, not later, but now. On today, at this moment, I must practice right action, right speech, right attitude, and with the help of the right view. And then uh, you try to uh, put the right effort. Right effort meaning not procrastinating, not being uh, neglectful of time, but try to do it today. At this moment, I must practice right action, right speech, and right discipline, the discipline of doing these things, right? Like the mantra, or prayer, or meditation, whatever you do. If you have right effort, then you will fire yourself a daily, carefully crafted discipline of meditation, or practice, or prayer. 
let you say you do that many hours of work and then you wash or you clean or you garden or you, whatever you do commun- in the community. You actually attend to them unfailingly. Every day you have some things to do and you look forward to them and you, you give good time. You, you make sure you do show up on time and do things properly. When you do a few things well every day, you are happy. Your life, your day was really, really good. Why? You employ right effort. See, right effort it gives you right outcomes. It makes you feel uh, you you fed you, you clothed you, but you didn't waste your day. <laughs> Feeding and clothing, cows do, kangaroos do, without any education. So just merely being able to make an earning and feed and clothe and shelter is nothing human about it. You know, so as a precious person who's human, must do a little bit that makes a difference to other people's life. That due to discipline, we always showed up. We, we they went there to uphold the activities, or uphold the uh, sessions, uphold the activities. We help them, and even others not there. You that doesn't discourage you. See, that's the right effort. People with the right without right effort, they get discouraged because he's not doing it. Why should I do? And almost the other people's wrong effort is a good cause for our wrong effort. <laughs> Discouraged by them. No. Other people may have amazing reason why they couldn't be there. They must have a lot of other duties. They usually do. And I happen to be having free from that. So instead of thinking why they are not there, they must have other reasons they couldn't be there. But I have no excuse. I have reason to be here. That kind of right effort. Very good, very good. Right effort is industry, it's diligence, it's joyous effort. It brings some kind of spark of your life back when you have right effort. For somebody, for something, for someone you love, someone who's very kind to you, do something with them, for them. It's really, that's the right attitude, remember, doing for others. Not thinking, what is in it for me today? Yeah, I told you a girl to call for me, to go. It's too far for me. Everything is not convenient for us. That's not right effort. That's a laziness effort. You know, busy is being lazy. <laughs> busy being lazy is also right effort, I think. <laughs> not right effort, but is a lot of effort is wasted in thinking. I'm busy, I, it's too much for me, too much for me, too much for me. So in any case, self-discouragement. Or self-discouragement. But right effort is self-encouragement, you know. We have this someone in here we are worthy listening to. Now we listen to that heart, we, 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 we put the effort. You know, don't procrastinate, don't take excuses. You know? It doesn't mean you should also push too hard on yourself either. Right effort isn't you know, overzealous. Overzealous people, for, for a little while, they're really very zealous, and then they run out of steam. They just use, they don't do anything at all. And that's not right effort. <laughs> that's a sprint run. That's a sprint runner. You know the sprint runners, 100 meter sprint runners? They can't run more than that. <laughs> when it comes to marathon, they're hopeless. <laughs> so, so, right effort is like a Slowly and steadily, continuously, day in, day out. Make every day worthy of your effort. Don't let, let any, any day waste it, you know. So make every day a little good effort that really warrants. Right, effort is good for people to manage their time. Timeline, they call it. You make a timeline. What I need to do by what time for this purpose. Don't take on too much on yourself. Lots of people... Greedy. They want to do everything. That's not right effort. That's greedy effort. <laughs> when you're greedy, you can't do any, even one well, let alone four. <laughs> Don't try to fit so many things in your, in, your, in your work, life. Try to fit few realistic things. And, and that's a good. You know, you just stay there and do that. That's a right effort. You will see. Then your energy is not dissipated because we all have limited energy, remember? We are doing various things, various other activities. We've got to be realistic. Those we do take up, honor them. Don't let ourselves down. Don't make ourselves feel guilty later on, not continuing that. 
Right effort is no regret. Yeah, you have no regret. And always you have put a really right degree of discipline. How do you know you have employed right effort? You have dropped quite a few bad habits. You have picked quite a few good habits. And the good habits you have picked up getting stronger and stronger. And bad habits are getting slimmer and slimmer and lesser and lesser in you. That's the outcome of, outcome of right effort. Outcome of right. That changes. It changes us. The right effort in relation to right action. Right effort in relation to right speech. Right effort in relation to right attitude. Yeah. Don't be lazy in changing your attitude. Don't be lazy in changing your actions. You know, right effort is not effort itself. Right effort to employ the right action. Like generosity or tolerance or forgiveness. Just be diligent to practice tall forgiveness. Somebody, if you're really diligent to forgive, it will heal them. Don't delay it. Because sooner you do, better it is. When you delay it, you feel like not doing anymore. It was so long time ago. The injury is there, hurt is there. It's got so bad to worse. Try to repair quickly. Hmm? Before the elapse of particular time, line, time line is by such and such, I must have this to be cleared. Like a debt, you know. You have to pay it by such and such. When you remember that, it's such a relief to pay that. Likewise, just try to make a discipline. By what time I want to heal this, I want to reconcile this, I want to apologize somebody, I want to thank them, I want to rejoice them, and not delaying them to do some time after 31st December, even though it's quite near, you know, <laughs> even though quite near in November. <laughs> but the, you know, 31st of December is 12 months, you know, so instead, within this week, within this month, I'm going to do something. So that is right effort. And the tendency to previously delay and procrastinate is now not suffering from that anymore, but actually yields the benefit of doing before it happens. So that's a right effort. When you have the right effort, then due to this right effort, so then the, the sixth one is called right livelihood. Right livelihood. Right livelihood really means some people think right livelihood is, is about what profession you should or shouldn't. It's possible some profession more preferable than others. If you can choose, for sure. But here right livelihood is meaning, meaning what is reasonable for supporting your life, what is excessively not so useful. So whichever mode or way of you supporting your life, don't engage in an in uh, unproper way of acquiring and greediness and a violent way, harmful way, destructive way and negative way, if you if you if you are supporting your livelihood, then you try to drop that, you know, what they call then employ right effort to change your right livelihood. And uh, and so uh, slowly try to make changes in how greedy we are how ungrateful we are, and then slowly try to uh, make a living that is really uh, proper uh, and uh, beneficial and, uh, if possible, not directly harming and uh, injuring anybody, and then uh, try to uh, yeah, try to do good with the living we make for to sustain our spirituality, not just to boost our possession and uh, material success. That shouldn't be the priority, but the material possession is only to support the journey of spirituality. Then, therefore, it doesn't become too offloaded, become not, not sort of you know, too heavy on the material side, too, too lacking in the spiritual discipline. That's a wrong livelihood. Then we just work, 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 work so hard. We are missing spiritual practices. In the week, in the day, in the month, we haven't done much uh, share of spiritual and meaningful things. We have just done so much backbreaking work just to earn, earn, earn. In the meantime, we are so stressed by it that our spiritual practice is neglected. Yeah, then we feel 
And what's the purpose of living like this every day? You know, <laughs> then, then we feel like it's just like a pointless, you know. Why well, do this all the time? But one actually makes a good, good proportion, prioritize how much hour or day or what you try to do, relaxation, to self-education, to dharma practice, doing communally good things. You really feel good. Then the other times you're working really disciplined, that really makes you to support to do these things. You know? There's a lot of balance. Right? Livelihood makes us, our life is good. You don't have to be wealthy to be, our life's good. You know, life could be, it may be very simple, but it could be beautiful. You don't need to need a lot, you know. And because of that, you're not missing the richness of spirituality, you know. And you're not spending time eating 13 course dinner all the time, you know. <laughs> you are, you are spending simple life, but doing other things really, really good, meaningful. You do things for others, you're able to do that because you make a living. Therefore, you can do that, you can support that. So, therefore, you're helping what we do with the making a living so that our um, physical need, material needs, doesn't bite your spiritual pride. You know, if that is harmful, then we are eroding spiritually. We're just weaker and weaker. Materially, we are, we are getting a little bit more, 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 Maybe wealthy or maybe more problematic, actually. <laughs> and then, then spiritually, the, the practice is just dwindling. That is wrong livelihood. That's why right livelihood means try to make a, a reasonable amendment and modification, the emphasis. And even right livelihood also means the physical well-being versus spiritual well-being. Not going always on the physical looks and appearance and possessions and what one wears, what one drives, what one has. You know, I'm sure still being practical what we need, but not becoming overly obsessive. So much so that actual practice of the spiritual and other things are neglected. They overcome the material things become so much the priority. That is not right livelihood. And uh, then people usually die, die, die wealthy, but they didn't live really, really happily. And then the wealth they have acquired all the years are completely, and then then have to left leave behind as if almost to the shame of the deceased. <laughs> if the deceased were to look back, oh gosh, so I have so much, but I gave so little. Now I can't even take anything with myself, and now. You know, you have no power to decide anything useful. Yeah, a lot of people when they die, they die miserably and they become hungry ghosts. So, due to wrong livelihood, they become hungry ghosts. <laughs> if they lived a very right livelihood, of course they will never be born as hungry ghosts. Hungry ghosts is caused by miserliness and greediness. And uh, one who learns not to become greedy and miserly will not, will escape the rebirth of hungry girls. Spiritually very, very different. An attitude in daily also. Never talk about what you don't have and when you have the right livelihood in your ups. You actually rejoice what all you have. You couldn't believe what you have. Only if you can really practice that, that matches what you have, you will be so happy. You know, so it's not so much what we don't have is, a, is, a, is an issue in the person who has the right livelihood. They practice Dharma every day. They feel so much better. Everything else is just to support that. <laughs> then there is no lopsidedness, right livelihood. Yeah? So those are the six, first six eightfold paths. Seventh eightfold path is right mindfulness. Uh, right mindfulness is, this is exactly... Uh, which connects with everything, yeah? So when we're talking higher training of discipline, discipline is covered by right action, right speech, right speech, and right livelihood is covered with that. And then uh, this is higher training of uh, meditation is mindfulness, right mindfulness, and right meditation. So right mindfulness meaning mindfulness in all the other uh, first six, you know, from right view, all the way to right livelihood. We are, whether we are mindful or not, whether we are, 
whether we are cognitively aware of that law of impermanence and unsatisfactoriness, selflessness, and so on. The more frequently we are able to remember that in everyday life, like if you remember impermanence in the morning, you wouldn't have a difficult morning, you know. You wouldn't be whinging and complaining and nagging about something didn't go very well. Why? If you're mindful of impermanence. <laughs> when we don't remember the mindful impermanence, then when something unpalatable happened, then we think that's like a tragedy. I went through this. Could you believe this is what they're doing or they're not doing? Then we carry on and make it even more worse. We whip it up. <laughs> we whip it up. <laughs> because we are not mindful of the right view, you know? <laughs> view of impermanence. But we are mindful. This In Buddhism, the mindfulness is not other than this, you know. Otherwise, materialism, spiritual materialism, mindful of leadership, success, progress, and productivity, all this mindfulness these days they promote in secular. These are materialism they're promoting. They're not producing, talking mindfulness of right view. They don't talking about... It's not Buddhist mindfulness, it's not talking about the right view. <laughs> Hope those people are doing lots of mindfulness just for material pursuit. That is not mindful. Not Buddhist one, for sure. Even developing destructive weapons takes a lot of discipline. But that's not my right mindfulness. That's a, that's a pseudo-mindfulness. That's artificial. That's only for some kind of things you know, just to shoot at a target. Uh, it's good they can make a, develop a technology to shoot at a target and bring it down. But what would that achieve? To destroy some people, some other flights or some other things. You know, it, so here we have to therefore distinguish mindfulnesses, mindful of those, those four views, four right views. And if you have those four right views, amazing, then the mindful and the right attitude. Yeah. If I'm wrong attitude again. When you know it's your wrong attitude mindfully, you quickly take back, you quickly accept all the blames. When you know that your own attitude has not been corrected and mindfully guarded, then things happen, we blaming others. See? Mind. There's no mindfulness, right attitude, therefore attitude is wrong about other people. Again, go out, gone out of the boundary again became outsider, <laughs> no longer inside the boundary of the Dharma. Because one is behaving or thinking as if, as if it's all a fault of the outsider. And therefore, mindlessness of action. Then they will resort to aggression, violence, uh, retaliation, uh, punitive measures, <clears throat> unforgiving attitudes. You know? Uh, so, right, then there is no mindfulness, right? And then, no mindfulness speech. And then, say horrible things, you know, over small things, you know, and, and keep saying these things because they're not mindful of speech. So therefore, this mindfulness covers all the above, you know. And of course, then, then mindlessness of, no mindfulness of their effort. They don't, they waste a lot of time in some useless things, for good things, they're not able to put time at all. So mindless, they are not mindful of effort. They're wasting so much time doing something that has no going to be outcome, but we're doing very little for good things as much as they give so much time for that. See, the mindlessness, because no mindfulness, the effort is, a lot of energy is wasted. <coughs> Simply take months and months to prove somebody wrong instead of taking one's responsibility, taking someone to court, litigation, as if that's going to fix some problems by ego-driven, wrong effort, wrong waste of money. Any spending you do, all wasted down the drain. It will bring no peace and happiness. Right livelihood is not right livelihood. Now one is wasting, wasting the hard-earned money for for the sake of preserving your name, <laughs> for keeping your name clean type of thing. One does not go there because you have right mindfulness and you're not going to waste any of your uh, livelihood or earned hard, save, hard earned savings or anything like that. So you can see the mindfulness is so important in Buddhism. It covers all the above. So 
and and that and that is the right mindfulness. But when you have right mindfulness, it we become mindful of what we do or say, how we react, how we don't react. Sometimes no reaction is the best reaction. It's tolerance, is called. <laughs> it's called tolerance. <laughs> You know, when you don't react, are you not reacting because you're nothing to react? Or you see that if you had said this and that, it's all going to be no benefit. So just, just bury your ego, you know, accept, accept the defeat. <laughs> accept the defeat. As like, if they're going to benefit, that would be good. But you know, it's not. Ben. That's a tolerance. Tolerance is distress tolerance. Tolerating hardships for the cause of peace for the cause of reconciliation, for the cause of you becoming more courageous. See, tolerance, you know, that is right effort, you know. That is really right mindfulness. Someone seems so unreasonable. But to unreasonable person, you don't do more unreasonable things because unreasonable thing doesn't work. <laughs> if it works, they have already done it. <laughs> So since one unreasonable doesn't work, two will make it even more worse. And so you realize, because they are unreasonable, I should practice tolerance. This is my karma, perhaps. Maybe it is. If not, I'll purify theirs. So much the better. <laughs> even if it's their karma, I'll purify them. I'll do it. Wow. That's a really, really right mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is when you are least convenient to practice tolerance, and then you tolerance, you know. That's why the tolerance is highest virtue, because most people don't have the right attitude all the way down and right mindfulness. Mm, amazing. This, not right now, a few weeks, few days is difficult, but it will be good for my future. Good for reparation. And this will, even when I die, I'll die without regret. Even when I sleep, I'll sleep sound sleep. In the meantime, I might have to bury my ego and tolerate this. This probably is a result of my own harm doing in the past. Anyway, see? Now the right mindfulness is kicking in. <laughs> it is just saying all right stuff. And your mind is nodding it. Oh, thank you. Can you say that very more? You know, I don't think like this usually. Please say that one more time. <laughs> see, 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 now a lot of Intelligent conversations happening, you know, with Dharma is powerful. It's just re making you realize, realization Dharma is called. There's no resentment there. There's amazing humility to do that. It's just like you're being washed right in front of yourself by this ex practice of tolerance. You have amazing blessing of Dharma. Now that is peace. That is better than honoring the Buddha, better than prostrating to the Buddha, better than bringing flowers to the Buddha, better than lighting thousands of lamps in, uh, you know, why waste oil when you can practice tolerance? <laughs> why, why do all sorts of things when you can practice tolerance? Tolerance is the most productive practice. Productive, most productive practice. And so, because Buddhas are always there, Omnipresent. They know exactly what you're doing. You know? You don't have to invoke them. They know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> and you know that. And hence, your mindfulness has made yourself to be very, very apt. And then, of course, all of these first seven mind, seven eightfold path is totally dependent on the eighth one, the right meditation. That's the meditation, practice meditation. So when you list all the Eightfold Path, the top is right view. That's the highest view. The bottom is right meditation. That's the meditation. So higher training meditation is the meditation and mindfulness. Higher training of wisdom is usually the right view. And the right effort is necessary to, for all the above. You know, whether it's rather, right, whether it's a higher training of discipline, or higher training of meditation, or higher training of right view, this wisdom, you need the right effort. So in this way, a Buddhist person becomes conversant into the application of the Eightfold Path, particularly in relation to the training of self-discipline, 
Discipline is the kind of a self cognitive behavior therapy, basically. Physical behavior, verbal behavior, and attitudinal behavior. So that's the self discipline. Higher training of meditation is in order to have this available in our everyday, one must meditate. So, so therefore, you try to do meditation, like calm about meditation, like deity yoga, mantra recitation, sadhanas, practices, uh, prayers, reciting the sutras and dharanis, and attending to, say, devotional practices, like in front of your home shrine, you make the water offerings, flowers and lamps, make them as a, as you're really having a guest for whom you prepare, you know, like that. You always do this very, very... Then slowly you sanctify your place of meditation. That's called right meditation, some kind of behavior, some kind of... The setup is very good for your, for your right meditation to occur. In the centers we have that, then every dwelling place of a practitioner must have a little table somewhere in your place, and you dutifully attend to that. Why? You. This is. That is. These are just paraphernalia for the meditation to occur. Right meditation. How do you know right meditation? Because there's a place you do the meditation. Right meditation. Only when you do the right meditation. You know. Then, the right wisdom. The, what do we call higher attaining of wisdom manifests. The wisdom discerning those four. Seals of Dharma, yeah. Intellectually, we heard it, we read it, we just agree to it. A lot of time, we agree to it. But how good is our realization of this? Only through meditation, not just reading and reciting and contemplating. What you actually meditating? Give time for it. You got to give time to it. You know, if you give time to it, you know, then you can do it. It's just like any study, you know. You know, I have a you know, cousin, cousin-in-law, I think, my cousin's husband, I don't know what we call it. <laughs> cousin's husband is cousin-in-law. He studied uh, nursing when he first came. He, f- he got nursing degree already, but he's not happy to do nursing because he thinks he's some, mm, he's, he want to be, he got a mind that is a bit more than nursing can do. So he, he doesn't want to do nursing. Then he learned to do engineering. Now study engineering already the first year, nearly finished. And I met him the other day, on Sunday. They drove me to the airport. I said, how's engineering? He said, if I give time, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's a time, yeah. <laughs> so when he gave lots of time, you know, engineering is very good, he says. It's all about math and because he's doing aeronautic kind of engineering and uh, he's, he's got, a must, got a good mind. And He says, if I give time, it's not difficult. If I don't give time, it's a technical, not, not easy to understand. It's like that. Like that. So uh, if you give time to your meditation, then your realization of those teachings are not just academic, not just intellectual. You can see whether it's half an hour or one hour or whatever you do, and you do that regularly, you will earn your own self-respect. You will feel happier. Nothing doing can make you that happy. People go all the way to Bateman's bed, drivers. <laughs> Trying very hard to reach to Bateman's bed. Some all the happiness is up there, you know. And uh, <laughs> then spend almost a good 30% of a week's earning just to get there. Just Then drive back all the way. <laughs> what a waste of time in <laughs> searching happiness in the beach. <laughs> When a person who has good discipline, meditation, they don't need to change the location. They need to change the, what they do with the time. <laughs> so, so then your daily practice of meditation happening more regularly, that is really a Buddhism in a nutshell. Is, if you've got really Buddhism in your, up your sleeves, your home practice and daily life is really developing. To boost that, you come to the center uh, weekly, uh, twice, once, whatever you can afford time, you know, due to your, you come to make a habit of that, commitment to that. Then it boosts your daily practice to knowledge, some knowledge, and then you can see how 
well balanced your life is. Then the days and hours that you go to work, you're much more sane, you're more tolerant towards others who are not, who are a bit aggressive and you just don't think they are bad. They just, they. I used to be like that a long time ago. Now I must practice understanding. When sentient beings have no dharma, they are basically unprotected. They're very unguarded. They are uninsured cars. Yeah. But we, ever since we have found refuge, we are insured cars. Now we can drive, but at least with a bit of peace of mind. If something do happen, <laughs> we are insured. <laughs> you can see, you know, in life difficulty things happen. You know, as a Buddhist, you don't, you don't react like that. You don't carry on like that anymore. You know, you just do the normal thing, whatever is forgive, practice kindness, meditate on impermanence, selflessness. They are all there and so obvious. When we become very, very consistent with that, there's a lot of self-respect. Then, when we have self-respect, you know, this is not self-indulgence, this is always a lot of dignity in what you do daily, and you really keep up that, and really keeps yourself in an order. It's rather like, a, like doing your thing daily, and you feel good. If you, don't, if you lapse something you meant to do, you then don't feel good. Do your duties, and then, then you see good in others. Amazing. Then you, you, you start noticing. You have an eye for the good in others. You can see good because you are now pure perception. When you are in a good things happening in you, you can see the good in others. You don't have this, this tinted glass in your mind anymore. It's all cleared. And, 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 uh, and so then, outwardly, maybe you, nobody, maybe people need or people don't know you are Buddhist, but it doesn't matter. You're, you just have to be the kind person that everybody can respect you, can receive benefit from knowing you. When that is happening, then there is a lot of what you call um, uh, gentle works are happening, gentle waves happen. The wave of your gentleness is affecting those around you and uh, it will bring a lot of peace wherever you frequent. And, uh, and there's not a lot of commotion or drama. Where? Because there's dharma. Where there's dharma, there shouldn't be drama, they say. <laughs> they say, more dharma, less drama. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so we're going to come to conclude here, as you know, because this term I'm doing this only first uh, first four four terms, uh, for the first four lessons, and uh, next week onward, and uh, Jamyangla here, who's been a Dharma brother and a monk for many years, you know, he reads to bed and he's been with me, I think, the, one of the longest, uh, so. Um, so he's going to share with you on the on the miracle practice of bodhicitta. So uh, I urge you to all um, be here. And uh, so so I thank you all for being here. And I'm off to India mm. <laughs> on a um, on very important place. Oh, opportunity to, to pay respect to my teachers and and holy places. So we we'll, we we'll think of you. So we do the dedication there. Page eleven. <laughs> By the merit of this, me we attain the state of omniscience, defeat the evil enemies of defilements. May I liberate all sentient beings from samsari oceans, the permanent waves of birth, all the sickness and death. Dear <laughs> 
But listening to the excellent and precious of my and uh, teachings, whatever boundless merit I've acquired, may all sentient beings become precious and stainless vessels to retain the excellent and precious of my and uh, teachings. May the supreme and precious Bodhisattva take birth here, not down the soul, where it has been born, made, increased, and abundantly without degeneration.